Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Tuesday um, AFSO educational webinar. Today we are hosting Mark Sturbina. He's going to talk to us about um, his career and his experience. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Uh, before we get started and I pass it on to Mark, I wanted to give you some information about the event. First of all, uh, we record all of this webinar, so uh, please know that this is the case and we will be posting a recording of the event on our website um, after the event and we will be also sending it to you via email. Um, in addition to that, you can ask questions throughout the whole presentations and we encourage you to do so. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so if you want to ask a question, you can do that in the chat box um, or in the Q&A um, in Zoom. So please feel free to do that. We'll also go through some polls during the presentation, um, trying to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, we'll listen to Mark and his presentation, and then at the end, we will also have a Q&A with you guys. Uh, and since I think today we have a little bit of a small group, we'll try to uh, unmute those that uh, have questions so that we can have uh, this a little bit more fun and interactive as well. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to let you know to, that we have this event on a regular basis every Tuesday morning. Um, so if you want to check out our calendar for the, the upcoming event, please feel free to do that on our website. It's athletesoul.space slash events. Uh, we have a couple of things coming up. Uh, today is Mark. Next week, we're hosting two of our uh, uh, therapists from Athletes Soul that will be talking about ambiguous loss. And then after that, we'll be also having one on mindfulness. So stay tuned and check out in the, the event. And uh, for now, um, I'm passing it on to Mark. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about his, uh, his professional rugby career um, and um, how he ended um, the career, this career, okay? Are you good to go, Mark? Good to go, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining this morning. What a beautiful day to talk about anxiety and uncertainty. Uh, you could be anywhere right now and decided to, to join us, so really grateful for that. And let's, let's jump in. I see a small group, as Miriam said, which is a fantastic opportunity to, to make this interactive, as she mentioned. So please participate today. What a wonderful opportunity for you to ask questions and to have, I love little intimate groups like this. So I'm gonna share my screen and get started. Let's get into it. This is what we're talking about today. Timely, obviously, because of the current climate. And I'll be talking a little bit about my career and how my rugby career ended and the journey that I took after that, which has actually prepared me quite well for what's happening in the world right now. And maybe provide some parallels that, that you can relate to in dealing with what you're dealing with in your own way. So very little info and a bit of background on myself. That's how you spell my name. I know it's weird. We say it differently, Stabina. It's Russian before you ask. So I used to play professional rugby. That's me as a young tucker at about 22, 23 years of age. I grew up in Sydney, and this is me playing professional rugby in Sydney. I got a contract at about 20 years of age. And then that led me overseas. I ended up playing in France for a couple of years, and then uh, the UK, England. And then I played in Wales for four years. They love their rugby over there. So I took a, a four-year deal, it ended up being, and in my fourth and final year of my career, this happened. So that's me lying fully conscious, as you can see my eyes open, but with no feeling at all. This was during a match over in France in Toulouse. It was an accidental tackle. I fell awkwardly. Three very large humans fell on top of my head, and I was in an awkward seated position making a tackle. I got my head caught in close, they landed on top of me. My head went very, like between my legs as I was sat down and I felt a massive crack and heard the crack. And this was the result. Once all the bodies kind of dissipated and jumped off me and went on with their business, I couldn't move. So it took 10 minutes to get me off the field and I was rushed to get emergency surgery that night. I fractured C4 and C5 of my spine and pushed against my spinal cord. And luckily didn't sever my spinal cord. I walked out of hospital miraculously five days later, and here I am to tell the story 
with near enough a full recovery. Now, that's a little bit about me. So let's, I just wanna know who's on the call. There's a few of you. Uh, let's hear briefly about where you fit into all of this and maybe give us a clue as to what your current situation is. This is directed toward athletes, but you might not be an athlete. Okay, that's, that's for later on. We'll, we'll, we'll ask that later. So Mir Miriam, do we have a poll just asking what people are? Um... There we are. Beautiful. So are you a college athlete? Are you a retired college and moved on to the next phase of your life or part of your career, your professional athlete? So go ahead and take 10 to 15 seconds. Choose the one that most represents where you are right now. And that'll give me a sense of who I'm talking to and I can kind of direct my examples. And just wrap it up now. Maybe you're none of the above. Maybe you're just an in interested webinar participant. Okay, do we have those results, Mims? Let's yeah. see what people said. Who, are we who am I talking to today? I don't see any answers coming up on my screen. Did you see um, we have 33% competing athletes, 33% work in the sport industry, and 33% work in the health industry. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Very even group. I like that. So we're quite diverse. Um, we're all into sports. So I'll continue. So back to me lying there without any uh, feeling in my body, uh, being attended to by seven medical staff. This ended my career. So I could not play rugby again. And this is just showing you a photo of like the definitive moment in my life. And all of a sudden I found myself no longer a professional rugby player. So as you can imagine, that brought up a lot of feelings and emotions and uncertainty and fear. And to name a few, these are the main feelings I was getting after loss of my career. Obviously the game day experience was huge. My favorite part of playing sport. That was no longer a possibility. Running out in massive stadiums with a massive crowd, the 24 hour build up, the camaraderie, the adrenaline. I could never replicate that exactly the same way. So I was starting to feel withdrawals from that. There was a lost sense of purpose. That, that was why I got up in the morning. That was why I lived in Wales in a, a, a rainy, crappy weather country was because I was a professional rugby player. And that's what my purpose or so I thought was my purpose every day. Now I'm living in Wales, not as a rugby player. What am I doing here? What's my purpose? And with that came the significance. So I felt significant in my role as a player. Other people gave me significance. I had that sense of importance. And again, linked to the purpose of being a sportsman. It was also that belonging, being in a team sport, and I know many of you can relate to this, that yes, I still had my teammates and my buddies if I wanted to have lunch with them or catch up for a coffee, but I was no longer in with them and have that sense of belonging that you feel when you turn up to training or turn up to work and you're in it together and you're preparing for a match together and you go through all those emotions, I no longer felt on the same page as my teammates in that sense. So I didn't belong in that sense anymore. I couldn't call myself a rugby player. My career ended not on my terms. It was premature. I had, yes, I was at the end of my career, but I had another couple of seasons that I'd planned to play and that was not gonna happen for me. So I had to deal with that disappointment. And as I mentioned, I didn't have a definitive plan. I was not prepared for that moment completely. So I started to build up a little anxiety about, well, what's next? Uh, maybe I should have a plan. I started to feel anxious about not having a plan and the uncertainty that lay ahead. And I, I must mention too, that I still had some nerve damage in my right arm and there was no knowing whether that would completely recover. 
So there was a lot of uncertainty around my physical condition as well. All these brought up some anxiety for me. And then, I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but this anxiety was not normal for me. So I was getting anxiety about my anxiety. I was starting to feel anxious because I'm a sports person, I'm an athlete. I'm not supposed to feel like this. I'm supposed to have it all together all the time. And that's how I'm able to perform at a high level. So what does this mean about myself? I started judging myself because I was feeling anxious and not knowing why necessarily, which brought about more anxiety. So a second poll, have a look at these symptoms. I'm gonna ask you now if any of you can relate to these in the current situation with your job. If you're a college athlete, you're not competing anymore. So do you feel any of these? Maybe you feel all of these. So with this poll, I want you to choose the one that most relates to, what you most identify with, with this particular poll, given the current situation and how your work has been affected. And maybe it hasn't. That's why we have an option of none of the above. So take 20 seconds. Don't overthink it. Just look, read through them and whatever pops up the most significant for you, go ahead and click that and we'll have a look at the results. Okay, so let's wrap it up now. Make your final answer. So Mark, so far um, we have 60%, 67% uh, responded anxiety about my anxiety and 33% <laughs> disappointment of competition not ending in my own terms. Yeah, uh, just as I thought. So yeah. basically all I wanna say is I get it. I've been through this myself and I've gone on a long journey to be able to uh, bring myself out of that and prepare myself for the next time like now that this happens. So thank you for sharing that everyone. And, and that gives me a really good sense that we're all in this together. So here's what I did. That's how I felt at the time. And I knew that it didn't serve me. And if I'm to move forward, I'm gonna have to do something about it. I got some work to do. Now this is huge. And I'm so glad I did this because again, especially as a male contact sport athlete, it's not normal that we share our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities. And I felt extremely vulnerable at the time. And it was a huge weight lifted for me when I spoke to a teammate that I trusted, that I knew wouldn't judge me. And I only had a handful of those, if that, on my team, being in that kind of environment. So that kick-started things. It was really good to just express how I was feeling and the anxiety about my current situation. It was actually that person that suggested I read a book that he was reading at the time, and that kick-started me on this personal growth journey. I hadn't read many of these kind of books. There's even a stigma. That's why I've got, you know, self-help written the way that that is, because people tend to think, well, I don't need help. That's kind of like for people that are broken or, you know, something wrong with them. But I read this book, and here it is. If you haven't heard of it or haven't read it, go get yourself a copy get the audio book. It changed my life and I, I refer back to it every now and then. And that's just what I needed right then because it taught me about the power of being in the present moment. I was everywhere but the present moment. I was worried about what I didn't have anymore, the loss of the career. It, all those feelings I told you that I was feeling was living in the past or living in the future. None of which or, or either of the two actually existed anymore they weren't real that led me to read another book which i recommend as well it's pretty old school dale carnegie how to stop worrying and start living and that's what i was doing i was worrying about what's next i was worrying about what's next it brought me back to the present moment so you can see what was really important for me at the time and it helped me with anxiety and the uncertainty it's just like just be here right now because that is the thing that is certain this present moment so how am i going to make the most of it and then that led me to this book, which is one of my favorites. It's kind of a, a Bible, The Four Agreements. I recommend that as well. So it's a very simple read and it, it just tells you, it teaches you in very simple ways to make it four agreements to live your life every single day and you'll live a happier life. And of course, it will deal with your anxiety. So back to what I did at the time, you know, What's next in my career? Well, let's go and try things. I'll only know what I wanna do and more importantly, what I don't wanna do if I try them. So 
hey, I'm a sportsman. I know a lot about my body, a lot about training. Seems logical I go and get a personal training diploma. And it was really good, just that feeling of bettering myself. And it was a 10-week intensive course. I was busy. I was distracted. And I was feeling better about bettering myself. And I got myself a diploma and qualified as a personal trainer. Traveling was huge. Obviously, that's not necessarily possible right now. But it was big for me. It was important just to get out of my environment and experience other things and the thrill of traveling. And that obviously led me back to Australia. I was living in the UK. I hadn't had Christmas with my family for eight years. So it was really nice to get back. Any anxiety that I was having is nicely dissipated when you're around your loved ones who just care about you and you for you. Not what you're doing, what you're, not what you're doing next, but just to have you by their side and enjoy times together. Again, being in the present moment. So the self-help books then led to workshops. Because I think it's one thing to read a book and really powerful, but to be around other like-minded people doing the work as well, just kind of like what we're doing right now as a group, uh, and if we interact a little later on, is really valuable. I did five-day intensive workshops. I did an eight-month leadership training course. I just had this thirst for knowledge and really felt satisfied with learning about emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? It's basically understanding your emotions and being able to manage your emotions and those of others, as simply put. So that's led me into my current status of uh, a leadership consultant for my company, which is winning EQ. EQ is another short term for emotional intelligence. Changing environment, like I said, traveling did that, connecting my family back in Australia, but then I made a huge change. I decided to live in a totally different country. LA was great, and that's where I am right now. And the main thing about LA was the weather. Everybody talks about the weather, but think about it. I wanted somewhere that's gonna uplift me, motivate me, and make me feel happy. So rather than choose a career or something, uh, or chase an opportunity to make money, but maybe in a place that I didn't want to live, I said, I'm going to live in a place that I'd love to live, and then I'm going to figure it out. And that's scary, but it was so important and so refreshing. It revitalized me. And again, it just took away some of that anxiety of being in that old place that I was living, where so many memories were about uh, ending my career and all those reminders around me. And here's a big one. So I started and I'm still connecting to my vision and my purpose. I stopped thinking about and worrying about how much money can I make in my next profession. Uh, I want my next profession to have a really cool status attached to it because I want to feel that importance again. It's like, no, no, what is important to me? And start asking those questions. And I was asking those questions of myself. And one thing that kept coming up time and time again was that I love helping people. I love inspiring people. I have a natural kind of coach and teacher inside of me. So I get to bring that out. And it's really satisfying to me when somebody walks away having spent some time with me, a better person, elevated. And the feedback that comes back is that's what made me feel alive. And that's what made me feel significant and have meaning. So I'm going to connect to that. And I'm going to be motivated by that and make my decisions based on what my vision and purpose is. Here's what I learned through this journey. And I'm hoping that you're taking these uh, learning lessons and applying them to your situation in your own life as well. So I talked about the power of now. I learned how to be present because that is one thing. And I still have to remind myself to be present. A lot of our anxiety comes up when we are thinking about the past like i said before and we're stuck in that past or we're thinking or worrying about the future so it is important for just your overall wellness to remember to be in the present moment easier said than done i know and it's a constant practice and there's a lot of ways you can do that but i learned how important that is my relationship with my ego not just my relationship with my ego but the definition of ego a lot of us understand the word ego as 
you know, we, we attach it to the context of someone being arrogant, right? Someone's got a big ego. We see it in the sports world all the time. We refer to ego as, you know, they have a, they have a large ego and uh, they're not a good team player because of their ego. Well, there's many ways to describe ego. And I learned through a lot of teachings and books and workshops that ego is actually our thoughts. And ego is the image that we put forth to the world. The image of ourself is as simple as that is our ego and it's not our authentic self. Without diving deeper into that, it's really important to understand in certain situations when it's your ego speaking or whether it's your authentic self speaking. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Acceptance. This is what we've had to do right now in this current situation. This is the situation. This is the new normal. So the first thing we need to do is accept that. And that's easier said than done. I understand. Just accept. Just accept the cards that you're being dealt. I like to think of it some way if you struggle with that concept of just simply accepting is look at how we're resisting certain situations. Maybe approach it from that angle. What has me feeling that resistance, that uneasy feeling, that anxiety? And again, it's related to our ego. Sometimes, sometimes our ego wants to be right. Have you, have you ever had that situation where you're like, oh, I just need to prove this person wrong, right, in an argument? And, and, that, and then one of my favorite sayings in that situation is, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Because it's as simple as that. It leads to unhappiness when we constantly have to control situations and be right about everything. So that's resistance. So when we work on removing any resistance we have to situations, then there can only be acceptance. That's what's left, acceptance. I learned what limiting beliefs were and I learned what mine were and they were holding me back. And a lot of it is conditioning from childhood. Again, we won't take a deep dive into that, but this is the self-awareness journey that I, that I embarked on that is so empowering is I learned just as we need to look at our strengths and work to our strengths, it's important to face up to our limitations, the beliefs about ourselves. And when you read the, the, the book, The Four Agreements, you'll learn all about conditioning as a childhood and how we've been shaped in these ways to the current day. And we need to break through those limiting beliefs and those patterns and behaviors that are holding us back from what we want. Here's a big one, especially for sports people. Anybody in a career that's been in it for a long time and put a lot of time and energy and invested emotion into what they do. The danger of thinking about that career as who you are. I'll say that again. There's a danger of being attached to the identity. What you do is not who you are. It's what you do. So I learned that. I reflected upon my career and I saw the ways that I was really defining what I did as me as a person. So when you get attached to that and that gets taken away from you, as it can at any moment, then I'm left. There's a real danger of being left with that who am I scenario. That's not who I am. So I learned, I started to learn who I was. And part of that is what makes me happy and what is the definition of happiness to me how many how often have you asked yourself what is happiness we use the word a lot i just want to be happy i just want you to be happy i just want them to be happy i just want happiness have you really looked at what that means to you because i think we we tend to throw in words and we disguise them as happiness like pleasure and pleasure is part of happiness for me anyway but that does not define happiness for me. Pleasure can be too much pleasure and chasing pleasure and instant gratification can also have a dark side, right? So in happiness, I, I see fulfillment and satisfaction is really important too. So we really need to get clear on our definition of what makes us happy and what happy, true happiness, long lasting happiness is so that then we can choose the right decisions to achieve that. We all know how powerful gratitude is, but that's one thing that I really learned. And more importantly, I learned that I need to practice it. It's one thing to just know it and know that it works, 
but you have to sometimes practice it all, all the time. So I got into a, a really good uh, gratitude practice. It's science that when you are in the moment of expressing gratitude for something or somebody else, it is virtually impossible to be sad, to be depressed, to be angry. Try and do it. Try and think of someone in your life that you're really grateful for and express that in yourself and why you're grateful for it and try and be uh, grumpy at the same time. <laughs> it's impossible. So doesn't it make sense to practice being grateful and gives us perspective and it has us focus on what we have, not what we've lost. Life balance, again, it comes back to that attachment to my identity and being attached to just doing one thing all the time. And we do need to focus to be the best athlete we can possibly be. We've got to put a lot into it. But I'm a true believer that you, can, you have time for other things and it's important to focus on other areas of your life, all areas of your life and elevate those and they are interconnected. So when you focus on your sense of who you are in other areas outside sport, it can only enhance your sport. It can enhance you as a person and a teammate and you'll become more coachable, et cetera, et cetera. This is huge, kindness and contribution. Again, we all know the power of it, but we need to practice it. You know, we have busy lives and make it part of your practice. Make it purposeful and intentional. Choose a time, choose uh, a day, if you like, to be your, your kindness day. And, and purposely write down how you want to contribute to other people and focus outward instead of just inside ourselves. That's where a lot of our anxiety comes from. And it's a way to get to deal with anxiety is to stop thinking about ourselves for a moment. When we get caught up in our own troubles and our own bubble, extend yourself outside the bubble and your anxiety will reduce with us. Start thinking about other people and how you can serve them. And it doesn't have to be a huge gesture. You could just write an email or a text or call somebody that you haven't talked to in a while and let them know how much you appreciate them. And the sense of satisfaction you get from feeling their happiness and gratitude toward you is really something worth replicating over and over again. I talked about my, I'll say it again, purpose, my why, my vision, and finding out what that is, asking the question constantly, what is that? Because once you have established that, and that is your main motivating factor, let me tell you, everything else, that becomes bigger than any of your excuses. That becomes bigger than any of the hardships that you're experiencing. Any of those tough times, when you just feel like you can't persevere anymore or it's just too hard to handle or it's draining or it's when you are connected to why you are doing something in your overall vision and purpose that helps you motivate and drive through those tough times like the time that we are experiencing right now. So here's where you come in. That's what we're here to do. I'm sharing my story so that perhaps it can help you with dealing with, as many of you said, the anxiety about your anxiety. Um, well, the first thing I'll say about that is it's completely normal. And that's one thing that I learned. And it's okay to feel anxious. And you need to be, I talked about contribution and kindness. Well, we get to be kind to ourselves as well. And be kind to yourself for feeling anxious. It's a human trait. And beating yourself up for it is only going to send you into a further downward spiral. So here's a shameless plug for a little ebook that, I, uh, that I've just written, which mentions a lot of what I'm talking about right now. And it has other resources that you can click. So practical resources that you can visit and go to that can also help you deal with this uncertainty. I wrote it specifically for this time. It's called the survival guide. And the premise is that we're all in survival mode at the moment. Our survival instincts are kicking in, but there is an opportunity to thrive as well. I'm not going to take away from the fact that we are all in survival mode and that's normal. So let's take that, let's embrace that and let's bring a thrive mentality in. So go ahead and download, it's free, download it, go to Winning EQ, you'll find it there and I think you'll enjoy it and pass it on to friends. I also have a podcast called The Survival Guide, which I think you'll also get a lot out of. 
So the self-awareness check-in, I told you about my personal growth journey and it's been a life changer for me and it is a constant practice. So here's what you can start doing and you've all built a lot of emotional intelligence throughout your lives and especially during your careers. Athletes do develop that, especially in team sports. And you might not be aware of just how emotionally intelligent you are, but it is a tool. It is a weapon sometimes when you have a good grasp of who you are as a person. And here's how you can start. So self-awareness check-in for you might look like this. And it's just a series of questions. How am I feeling at the moment? When I say self-awareness check-in, you can do that right now and you can make that a practice every single day. How often do you ask yourself? I know that we ask a lot other people how they're feeling and we have compassion and empathy for others. Hey, how are you doing today? Oh, that really sucks. How are you feeling about that? How often do we do that for ourselves? It's really important. And that also is a good practice of learning and identifying our own emotions right? Lean into it. Don't shy away from feelings that have come up or try and stuff them down. How am I feeling? How can I describe it to myself? Write it down. And then you get a better sense of your emotions. Then you'll get a better sense of how to manage them and move through them. I talked about what is my definition of happiness? Sit with yourself and write it down. What makes me happy? What gives me joy? What gives me fulfillment? What is my overall happiness? What's longer lasting happiness as opposed to just moments and glimpses of pleasure? And when I say pleasure, I'm talking about things like, you know, those really nice sugary foods that give us a boost, uh, that show that we love, getting a bunch of Instagram likes all of a sudden on a really good post that we put out there. That's instant gratification. Not bad, I'm not saying rule it out, but don't make that your basis of happiness. What do I want? Now that I know what makes me happy, what do I want for myself? Look ahead into the future, 10 years, the rest of your life, a year after the pandemic. What do I really want for myself? What's my ideal day? What's my ideal life? just in general, overall, when I've got all my stuff together and look at all areas of your life, look at community, look at family, look at finances, look at career, look at relationships, look at your recreation, look at your spirituality, things for yourself. Go ahead and be extensive on what you want. It's very important because we do tend to forget. Part of that is the vision. I mentioned it before and it is so, so important. When was the last time you asked yourself, what is my vision? And when I mean vision, I'm talking about the bigger picture. So what kind of world do I want to live in? Think that large. Like, do I want a world that is safe? Do I want a world that is unified and not as segregated as it is? Do I want a world where we're not, you know, Mother Nature is thriving and not suffocating because of the way that we're using this earth. I want clean air. I want clean oceans. What's important to you? And you might really surprise yourself and be really driven and motivated toward the kind of world that you want to live in and contribute to and the difference that you want to make. And you'll start to come up with some really passionate ideas about things that you can work toward and factor into maybe the career that you want. You might change careers once you figure out what's important to you. And this is important too. We know what makes us happy. We know what, or more or less, what our purpose is in our vision and what gives us meaning and significance in our life. So who do I need to be to achieve these things? Who do I need to be? Not just what do I need to do, who do I need to be? What kind of person? What kind of character do I want to have? What values am I going to live my life by so that I can achieve this, this vision, this purpose, and achieve what I want for myself? So you can check in again with, you know, do I need to be a courageous person? Do I need to be an influential leader? Do I need to step up in that way to achieve these things? Do I need to be making a lot of money? Don't feel any shame around that. 
in order to achieve what I want to achieve. So check in with that. And on the flip side of who do I need to be, you've got to look at, okay, I mentioned limiting beliefs before. What thoughts, habits, what are these character traits that you already possess that you've been conditioned since childhood to possess that might be holding you back from achieving these things? This is where you get to be honest with yourself, really honest with yourself. Put a mirror up to yourself and say, okay, I'm not going to shy away from my limitations. What are they? So that when I'm aware and I have a good relationship with them, now I can start breaking through them to be that person I need to be. So there's your self-awareness check-in. Getting back as we're kind of wrapping up this list of, of what you can do now to help deal with this uncertainty and anxiety is I told you about speaking to a trusted person before. I highly recommend it. And then getting in, in, a, in a group can really help you feel connected and not isolated in what you're feeling. It's important that you are around other people that are feeling the same thing and empathizing. Here's where mindset comes in. So we've lost a lot right now. A lot, a lot of us have lost our competition. And I need to mention as well, yes, I lost my career and I'm using that as basis for this talk, but I'm also a rugby commentator. And I was five games into the US National Rugby League this year where I was commentating and then they canceled the season. And that's a lot of money that's just been just gone taken away from me. So I've had to deal with that in this current situation. So an example of me turning a loss into a gain, all right, I've lost that income, I've lost that experience of commentating. Well, here's what I've gained. Some of those games required me to travel from Friday to Sunday, an entire weekend. Well, guess what I've gained? I've gained an entire three-day weekend with more time to do other things. So that's an example of focusing on what we've gained when we look at what we've lost. What are we doing with this extra time that a lot of us tend to have right now? And that's where we can always push forward and better ourselves. You're athletes, you're in the sports industry, you know all about that. So get connected to that again. It's like, okay, I can't do this, so where else can I improve myself? I've got social media here because I know, I, I knew we'd have a few athletes on, and building your own brand is, really important in this day and age there are opportunities for you that you don't want to leave on the shelf and we live in a world of social media which is so important to our branding so why not do a social media course get really good with learning how to build our brand your own website uh, videos maybe editing make sure you get out your story and you get out your true personality and it can be lucrative for you in the end but Get busy doing it. Now's the time if you're not doing it already. Kindness and contribution, I keep mentioning it and it's so important. Build it into your schedule. Don't just take it as something that, yeah, I know I, I'm a kind person, I like being kind. You might have to actually schedule it in. So go ahead and do that. That's what you can do right now. What does that look like? Am I gonna do a 30 day random act of kindness challenge and bring other people with me? I've done that before, that was a lot of fun and it was, a beautiful month for me of just giving to other people and it elevated me. That's an example of what you can do. I'm a big proponent of meditating. So I wasn't before, especially when I was an athlete, but meditation has become a daily practice for me. Even just 10 to 15 minutes, I wouldn't call myself a guru by any stretch, but I've learned and I'm the kind of person that needs scientific backing as well to buy into something. And the science is there, the neuroscience is there. And the big thing for me is, there's a part of our brain called the amygdala, if you haven't heard of it before, it's in the emotional part of the brain or the limbic system. This is a little almond shaped structure in our brain that is responsible for the fight or flight mechanism that kicks in. Like right now, we're very anxious and uncertain about what's going on right now. Our amygdala gets triggered and it stops us from thinking rationally. It, 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 hijacks our prefrontal cortex, which is a rational thinking brain that allows us to get into flow. Meditation or a daily practice of meditation has been proven to shrink the size of that little almond shaped amygdala that wants to just hijack and make us fearful about everything. And it shrinks it literally. So then it becomes less active and less intense when it kicks in and we're better able to manage it. So that should be enough 
to make you want to meditate every day if you're not doing it already. It allows you to focus. It allows you to be more calm. And there's the neuroscience behind it in very simple terms. I'm not a neuroscientist, obviously. Creativity is huge as well. And, and I've kind of combined two concepts into this one point. We know how important it is to connect with people. And I'm sure that you're all doing your best to connect. Don't underestimate how important connection time is. And when you let that slip, how it can affect us without realizing it. So that might be something you build in also to your schedule. I need to make sure I'm connecting with these people. And let's get creative with it because that can be a great way to mix things up as well and take us out of our anxiety. Creativity is a great way to reduce anxiety levels and bring more enjoyment and, and fun to your life, which is important. We've got to stop taking life so seriously, people. So get creative, play some games with the people that we love. This right here, I mean, I can just, maybe I could just wipe this whole, uh, this whole webinar and just give you, here you go, here's how you deal with anxiety. Because this is something that a rugby coach told me when I was early in my career, and it has stuck with me to this present day. And it's like a mantra to me that I just remember. And I just say it when I start getting anxious or I start worrying about stuff out of my control. How often do we do that? How often are we doing it right now? How many of us want to jump down the rabbit hole into conspiracy theories about, oh, this coronavirus is a fake. Oh, the government's doing this to us. Oh, this is not real. That's not real. It doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve me anyway. Remember, we're focusing on moving forward to control the controllables. And he said that to me when I was injured and I should be resting. And he knew I needed to rest. But you know what I said to him when he finally got it out of me? I said, I am worried that if I don't play, coach, the player that you put in my place is going to play so well that he'll then keep his spot and I'll never get back in the team. He said to me, you can't control how well that player plays. What you can control is deciding not to play and make yourself even more injured so it puts you on the sideline for 10 weeks as opposed to two weeks and then when you're on the sideline rehabilitating yourself you can control how well you do that how determined you are you might even re rehabilitate yourself to be stronger fitter faster than you were before so then i have no choice but to put you back on the field that's what you can control and that just sparked something in me that i've never forgotten and i apply it to Many, many situations. So control the controllables, people. Okay, so I wanted us to have an opportunity. It was, we're coming to the end of the webinar. Thank you all for listening and your patience. Uh, if there's some burning questions or even just you want to share. If you've, have you had an aha moment during that time? Have you had a realization? What's come up for you that we can talk about that we can share? Miriam, what's come up for you? Well, first of all, Mark, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I think there are a lot of things that you highlighted that we may have already known, but it's always great to like hear it again and hear it with different words and different examples. So I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, I did want to ask you a question and I get started while the others are, are waiting. Um, I wanted to know if you have um, example on how do you practice gratitude and kindness like if you can you give us some practical example of those or ways that you've inserted that in your in your day yes absolutely what well, one thing that i did um and and i do regularly is just i set my intentions every morning for the day which is important as well i don't like to wake up and then just kind of get into things without having a clear direction of what's going on so i will write down in the morning with my morning coffee um what's my intention what are my three goals for today what are my three big actions and a lot of them are around business at the moment for me so it's very business centric but on on top of that what am i grateful for three things that i'm grateful for today just to make me feel really lucky that that i'm here and and it's very easy for me having been what i've been through with the injury to connect to that but sometimes again we get into autopilot and we forget another thing i'd mention Miriam is a, a book called, uh, I think it's called Magic 
it's, it's in that series of The Secret. If anyone's heard of the book, The Secret, mm-hmm. it's another, it's like a sequel to that, but it, it specifically deals with gratitude and it talks you through a 28 day gratitude challenge. Uh, and, and so you read the chapter in the morning and it gives you tasks. The consistent thing is you write 10 things that you're grateful for. It's an extensive practice, but it is such a life changer. 10 things you're grateful for. And what's important is also why, why are you grateful for that? So it really sinks in. It's not just, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for the sun. I'm well, why are you grateful for the sun? Well, the sun elevates my mood and it just makes me really happy and it, I know it gives me energy and I know so dive into why you are grateful and do that for 28 days and whew, you'll be a very grateful person right and, and would you consider this as as a way perhaps to break the cycle on being anxious about the anxiety because I think this is something that we all can relate to and we it's building in a negative way like the more anxious you are the more uh, you know upset at yourself you feel about being anxious so how do you break the cycle um any any little tips for that yes thank you um and one thing i would say because maybe when i thought about this and being asked to do this uh I was wondering whether, I mean, a lot of this is kind of like a, pra- a lot of practices, long-term practices and, uh, and mindset, right? Which is, which is everything. There are, I won't take you through some, there are practical techniques. If people are really experiencing anxiety, there are breathing exercises and there are certain things and feel free to reach out to me for that. I wasn't going to make that this a part of this talk. So just in general terms, there are ways to, if you're feeling anxious and as you mentioned, if you're like, worried about how anxious you are or you're judging yourself for how how anxious you are that's the first thing is is the kindness that i mentioned before and just be like this is normal it's okay i'm not the only person that's feeling anxious right now and it doesn't mean i'm less of a person right but i do want to break through it and i want to move through it gratitude i'm just repeating what you said gratitude's a huge way just to bring you to the present moment because when we're anxious we're focusing on normally what we don't have or what we don't have yet. And here's another thing for you. This talk is about uncertainty and being anxious about uncertainty. We can even reframe what it means to be uncertain and look at it as a positive. That's exactly what life is. Life is uncertain. It's uncertain how long we're going to live. We could, sorry to say that, well, I'm not sorry to say this, we could die tonight. We could die tomorrow. It's full of uncertainty. And you know what? That's what makes the world and this life a beautiful place and makes us feel alive, that there is uncertainty, that there is that excitement of, well, I can create whatever I want to create. There's not this set fixed path for me. So start thinking about anxiety as an exciting thing because without, anxi- without uncertainty, this world would be a boring place. If we knew it was going to happen all the time, how boring is that? Well, and, and I think this is, a, this is actually a super good point because as an athlete, you deal with uncertainty every weekend with a game. You deal with uncertainty at every step of the way, whether you're going to be failing on a new skill or uh, a competition it's part it's it's part of the daily training and practice and the competition and so i think we're very athletes are very well placed um to deal with uncertainty and and it's trying to apply what you've learned from sport um uh, you know in in the current moment i think right i agree i agree and 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 to my point that's what makes sport exciting because of the uncertain nature of it all and and being able to navigate that and figure out ways to produce a result in in the uncertainty of of the sport and uh again that's that's if if that didn't exist and we knew exactly what was going to happen all the time i don't think we'd be playing sport we'd be doing something else to get excitement and make us feel alive um, Mark, we got a, a question from uh, one of our, our audience participants. Um, 
So Joy Burke is asking, um, he's a current professional athlete um, and also have a compelling passion to help people and inspire them. Um, and he's asking, how can I make that my career? How can we as athlete and former athlete team up to make a big impact globally? Whoa, wonderful that's a, question. That's a great inspirational question for the end of this, this webinar. I love it. And what I, what I see in that is, is there's, there's a, a practical side of that, which is what Athlete Soul does so well, is, is like, well, now that you've identified that's what you want to do, here are some resources. So that's one thing I would do is, you know, look through the website and get in contact with you, Miriam, and there are networking things that, uh, events that are important to, that's the other thing I think, look for support. What was the second part of the question is, is how to do it together? Did I hear that? How can we as athlete or former athlete um, team up to make a big impact globally? So what's beautiful about this is there's already an identification of how satisfying it could be to use our sporting profile to make a change, to make a difference in the world. Already just the fact that that question is being asked means that, who is it from, Joy? Joy Burke. Who, who asked the question, Miriam? Joy. So thank you, uh, uh, Troy or Joy? Joy. Joy, thank you, Joy. So yeah, Joy, that's the first step, is you are looking, what's that? I didn't say anything. Yeah, that's the first step is, is looking uh, beyond just yourself and, and oh, there's a delay. Um, so yeah, that's the first step. So identifying of like, how can I use what I do to make an impact? You don't have to be an athlete to do that. Anyone can make an impact. But as Joy suggested, it's better in numbers. You know, we can't go and change the world ourselves. We can try. And it can be fun trying and striving, satisfying, striving for that. But to make a real impact, we get to tap into our network and our support network. So that's the first step. Yes, I want to make a difference. And then develop a compelling vision and a, and a statement that you can say to people to enroll other people. Because life is an enrollment game. What I mean by that is we need to influence other people and get them on board with our vision so that they join us to make a difference out there. And that can take some practice. Practice your enrollment skills and influencing other people. And you can do courses on that, you can do public speaking. That's a very practical way at, at, at answering that question of like, how can we get together? Well, you need to make other people believe in your vision too, and they will follow you, trust me. And then you just, you just use the various networks there's a lot of networking events um there's resources as i mentioned that, that miriam has available on athlete soul to get in contact just start putting yourself out there do the work and find out what events are going on webinars like this are great and just make yourself visible and another thing i would say about that is here's an opportunity to use our social media to put our message out there and enroll people as well, as opposed to, you know, just kind of like letting people know how amazing the new car we bought is from the new salary, you know, the new contract that we got from our team. And here's my bling bling. I know that's just a very specific situation, an example, but that's what a lot of athletes tend to do because remember I talked about ego, we're projecting an image. We want to project an image so that people accept us. Well, instead of thinking of that, how about we have a vision and a message that we want to get out to the world and have people join us? So, yeah, we're halfway there, Joy. And I and I think um, there are athletes generally really like to help others. They're very involved in philanthropy. There's tons of organization out there that are led by athletes that help in many different ways. Whether it's equality, whether it's um, you know hunger, uh, youth. Um, so it's searching like how, what area that you want to help in, right, Mark? And, and, and linking, linking with these organizations that are already in existence. If you don't want to go at it yourself, like there are multiple organizations that you can go to and uh, 
um, try to connect with former athletes that have already done that or current athletes that are pushing the boundaries in terms of philanthropies and support and helping others. Um, I think there's a lot out there. Yes, or if you have it in you and you have the time and you have the drive and you're so connected to your passion and your vision, start your own foundation and bring people in to help you. Yes, you can get people to partner up, but I've seen a lot of athletes do that. They've started, they have something they really believe in, like the waterboys.org. They want that. One of them went on a trip to Africa and saw that they didn't have clean drinking water. What's that all about? How, how do they not? People are getting sick because they don't have clean drinking. Well, I'm going to change that. I'm going to bring my NFL buddies in with me and start it up and had a goal. We're going to have, you know, uh, a million people with clean drinking water in three years' time. And I think they've achieved that goal. How satisfying is that? And talk about dealing with your own anxiety. That is one way to not be attached to, I'm a sports person. This is all, this is my worth. This is all I do. This is all I have to give to the world. That's throwing a ball or kicking a ball. That's not true at all. That's what you do. Who you are is the kind of person that gets out there and helps other people and makes a difference. And that is one way to not get attached and feel that sense of loss about loss of identity. Um, and as you talk about identity, there's something I wanted to highlight that you touched base on the presentation today, and maybe it's a good way for us to wrap up our, uh, our webinar today, but um, it's something that resonated with me because I lived all over the world. Uh, but you talked about uh, living in a new place, changing your environment, and, um, and just helping you sort of, you know, step out of that, that role that you have and step into a new role. And I think this is so important and not to be uh, underestimated. The power of being able to move from one environment to another one to help with your transition, because sometimes you need that displacement to be able to switch roles. Often, you know, we are an athlete to our family, to our coaches, to the environment that is built around us. And you need to move a little bit away to be able to rebuild yourself um, peacefully and I, I thought that was that was a very interesting point that is not always made um, and I really like that I thought that was great. Thanks Miriam yeah and there's and the other the other piece to that is I mean I know I mentioned kind of like getting away from the triggers and the and, and the other distractions and the source of that anxiety if it's if it's to get a fresh start but especially athletes we 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 love challenges right so we have a tendency to want to be pushed and want to be challenged but we always associate that with sport and physical challenge whereas there's so much satisfaction in jumping into a, an emotional and mental challenge too like moving to a completely new city and i i moved to a new city with a, with a different language miriam's mother tongue so I, I moved to france and there was that constant challenge we need to embrace that and step up to that it can be frustrating at times but it's so satisfying when you get out of your comfort zone we should always be looking at getting out of our comfort zone jumping into the fire and then coming out the other side is so satisfying having grown through that experience travel is the best education as well you get a yeah. really good perspective I got to look at a different way of life, the way that the French lived in a little seaside town was eye-opening to me and really nice. And again, as Miriam, to your point, it got me out of that mundane, what I'm used to and what brought me anxiety, what I'm used to, go and learn different language, go and live in a different place and you'll build up resilience. Right? You can say, well, I did that. I was able to handle that challenge and I've come out and look at me now I can speak another language now I have a new bunch of friends now I have another adopted family that was my experience anyway and easily yours as well yeah well Mark thank you so much for uh, for the presentation today for sharing your experience your story uh, what a valuable um, uh, presentation and takeaways from it I really enjoyed it I hope that everybody else enjoyed it um, want to thank you everybody for joining us this morning and um, uh, participating in our polls and questions. And I hope that you guys gain uh, some knowledge from the presentation. Uh, we will follow up with an email with the recording from it so you can reuse it if you want, as well as uh, the link to Mark's uh, The Rival Guide. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Mark. 
uh, or check out our website at assaysoul.space um, if you're looking for other resources. But thank you so much. Um, I hope that you all stay safe and healthy out there and uh, looking forward to uh, connecting again. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks. Have a great day.